Greetings everyone and welcome back to another episode of Plan B Success. Today we have Brett Cooper and Evans Kerrigan with us who run Integris Performance Advisors, a firm that they co-founded. And they're focused on increasing employee engagement, improving efficiency, productivity for several companies and several people who go out there and work every day. They have a book as well that they published recently, and the book's called Solving the People Problem. So they're very focused on relationships, healthy organizations, and healthy businesses. Having said that, let's welcome them both. Welcome, Brett and Devin. Thanks, Rajiv. Glad to be here. Thank you, Rajiv. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Tell us, uh, you guys have uh, written a book, you run an advisory company on employee health, employee engagement. I like to call it health because that's what relationships are about. Mm -hmm. So, how did that come about? Where did you get started? Uh, and uh, we'll probably come to your personal stories as well as to the, the conflux as to how you came together. Yeah, Rajiv, this is Evans, and I'll, I'll take that first one uh, off the bat. And, and actually, it does very much run into our personal stories as well. Uh, Brett and I have known each other and worked together for 20 years now. Um, and through that time, we've had multiple pivots. We'll talk a little bit about some of those pivots along the way. Uh, but the first major one that really kind of talks about the, the founding of this company is Brett and I were working for an organization that helped with uh, Six Sigma and Lean implementations for organizations. So focused on the tools of how do we get more efficient, how do we make those things happen. And, and while we were doing that work, I was working with a bunch of clients and finding that some of my background in leadership development, team development, was really helping us get much better results. It wasn't really just about the, the continuous improvement tools. It was about actually getting in there and helping people improve their relationships because no matter how good the tools are, it really comes down to people implementing things. So uh, we took that and uh, talked a little bit about we could be doing this in a little bit different way, really reaching people at a, at a deeper level and uh, decided that we needed to actually approach this differently. And that was actually led to the founding of Integris. It, it was really kind of that pivot from uh, continuous improvement as a set of uh, tools and a methodology to how does that actually help with a, a, an organization and the individual employee's health along the way in terms of how do we actually make that stuff happen. So we uh, created Integris with still some of that continuous improvement focus, but much more of a focus on leadership development, team development, even individual development and emotional intelligence. And it worked with organizations to have a broader picture of what it meant to be successful and then what were the tools I could use to actually make that happen. Yeah, Rajiv, when we were working together at that time, uh, Evans was in charge of doing a lot of the facilitation and a lot of the project work, and my role was more on the, uh, on, on the client engagement, uh, on the uh, engagement strategy plan and things like that. And time and time again, I had executives telling me, you know, the whole reason we want to do this Lean Six Sigma, this process improvement, all this operations consulting, the reason you're here is that we want to really change kind of the DNA of our organization. We want to increase engagement across the organization and we want to influence our culture. And what, what we learned, what, what kind of Evans was talking about there in so many of the projects that we we're working on, we, we definitely returned fantastic results. Uh, hundreds to millions of, of dollars in, in project returns, which that was fantastic. But the thing that kept being elusive was that, that shift in culture. And so the, the, the pivot that Evans was talking about there when we decided, hey, let's go do this on our own, really was uh, in response to saying, you know, there's got to be a better way to help not only drive those project results, because, you know, hey, we, we all got to save money and we got to bring in the revenue, but how do we do that in a way that drives more cohesive teams, uh, better leadership skills, and, and generally uh, you know, more uh, interaction, more, more positive interaction across everybody in the organization? So how long has Integris been in business? We found Integris in 2011. So we had worked together at the previous organization for almost 10 years, actually. And uh, once we decided, yeah, you know, we got to go do this on our own, uh, that's, uh, we came together in 2011. So we're, we're almost 10 years in with Integris and, uh, it, we, we've had our pivots, uh, in those last 10 years, but it's been great. It's been fantastic. 
So, you know, when I look at uh, human resources and the journey of human resources, just from my experience, right? So, over the last probably about two decades ago, you know, maybe by the time we hit, get back to the 2000s, it was not a, it was not considered a very vital role, you know, managing resources, managing people. Although people probably are the most uh, precious resource at any organization, human resources was the last job anybody sought. You know, they were, people were excited to get into marketing or operations or sales and all of these. And then over the last two decades, what I've seen is it's kind of turned the tide. And it is considered a pretty important role right now. What's been your experience? Rajiv, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Um, I was lucky enough, actually, before I ever met Brent, that I had worked in some places where I was tied at the HR. I was in charge of leadership development, employee development, by its organizational development for a few organizations. And uh, while we hear every company say, our people are our most precious resource, Unfortunately, I would agree with you. That was mostly kind of nice talk and wasn't followed through on. Um, and, and I was lucky enough that I worked in a couple of different HR organizations where HR really did see itself as a business partner. And, and HR was it really saw their responsibility as how can we help our people move the organization forward? So not as a cost center, but as a, as a real business partner and part of helping make operations actually work. And that's part of what we kind of brought to our work here as well. And we find that, yeah, we're, we work very well with clients who have kind of gotten that enlightenment of it's not about happy talk. It's about actually this really is our competitive advantage is how we treat our people. Um, we, as I mentioned up front, we got started a little bit with a lot of that tools focus. And if you go back to the history of continuous improvement, then WH Deming here in the States and in Japan, or you look at the lean stuff, there's an equally important component, if you, if you think about it, that's around our respect for the individual and taking care of the individual. And all too often in organizations, they focus only on that efficiency side and they kind of forgot the people. The organizations that are successful and can carry this on and really see long term improvement are the ones who can actually balance that effort and see that creating the best possible work environment for people is actually how we can also get the best results. And our, our people really are our greatest resource. If we can listen to them, if we can hear them, if we can let them contribute, it's amazing what we can actually get done. Yeah, and 20 years ago, HR largely was focused on, well, we got to manage the benefits of the organization and, uh, oh, you know, we have to handle the onboarding process and, and more of those kinds of uh, benefits and operational kind of HR kinds of things and, and Raji, we've seen the same same transition that HR largely is now so much more around human capital and people development and uh, speaking of pivots uh, my guess is that everybody who is listening to this podcast whether you're uh, an entrepreneur small business owner or an HR professional uh, or, or, or anything else for that matter this year has been a huge year of transition of figuring out what's your plan B and and really, this is the uh, this year was was a major transition for Integris Performance Advisors and for me and Evans. Not just because we put out the book solving the people problem, but of course, as soon as COVID hit, if you think about what we do and everybody in our industry does, we're around developing people, and people learn and people grow usually when they get together, right? So. Most of, most of the time that Evans and I spend is either at a, you know, giving a, a keynote speech at a conference or getting people together and doing a facilitated team bonding, uh, kind of an event or doing a strategic planning meeting where we're, you know, we're getting people together and, and, and working on real issues. And this year, quarter two, we basically had no business whatsoever because everything that we had on the schedule that we were going to be facilitating or delivering was frozen. And the other thing that we do in our business is we supply resources, we supply assessments and products and a learning products to a lot of our HR clients and they do the internal facilitation and the internal training. And of course, they didn't know what was going on and they just froze down. So at Integris and for Evans and I, we had to majorly pivot this year. And in Q2, it was all about product development and you know, now what we're doing here on Zoom, 
this is how we deliver our business. And so we had to challenge some some pretty deeply rooted kinds of beliefs. I remember having conversations with clients in March and April. And when they were canceling their events, they were saying, well, we're just going to sit this out. And then, you know, come July, August, you know, we'll be back together. And then we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. And then when, uh, when July started to roll around and people were saying, well, we're not getting back together, there were a ton of people that were saying, we cannot do this virtual. That's not the way this is designed. That is not the way that we've been trained, uh, of, of, you know, developing others. And real quickly, we all had to realize, you know what? But that's the way we got to do it now. And a lot of us have been really successful with that. And many of our clients I know are telling us they actually like the, the interaction on virtual with the development processes that they're doing. In some cases, even better than getting people together in live classes because it can be more, uh, iterative. It can be more sequential. It can be small, smaller bite sites, bite size kind of interactions. And one of the things that we have found is that when you're trying to drive really behavior change, it's not about the classroom event, right? Classrooms are great about creating some awareness and some understanding, but really we want people experimenting with these new ideas so they can adopt them and build new habits. And what we're finding is that through virtual, we can actually spread out our connections, our touch points. And rather than having one event for a half a day or a day with somebody, we now can have five, six, seven, you know, one hour little segments spread out over the course of a month or two. And that keeps the stuff alive longer for people. And at least in, in the research that we've been doing is driving behavior change perhaps even more effectively than it was in the old model. So you're so right. So, you know, with, with remote work and the way people have embraced it or have been forced to embrace it, and now they're getting comfortable with it. You know, now there's higher productivity. They, they get to work from their own turf. So they are probably in a different mindset than going somewhere. They're, they're, they're actually saving on time, uh, energy, resources. There's so many pluses to it. And of course, there's also the, the other side of it where people have been off late talking about how personal and uh, professional lives kind of conflict and they end up spending more time working. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our, our book, Rajiv, uh, for those who haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet, Solving the People Problem is really all about creating higher levels of emotional intelligence by doing two things. Understanding yourself better. So understanding kind of what drives you and why you make the decisions that you do and, and then you putting that, that information, that knowledge to work. And then the second is becoming more familiar with other people, with other people's styles, with how they like to communicate with where their energy goes, and then using that information to adapt your own behavior to uh, basically be more effective to, to adapt your behavior for the mutual benefit of everybody who happens to be involved with that. And while you know, when we wrote the book, we started well, a year and a half ago in putting this book together, COVID wasn't a thing, remote work wasn't the norm for everybody, and we knew those ideas were extremely important. All the research out there, tells us that emotional intelligence is as important, if not more important, than things like IQ and technical skills. And Rajiv, I know earlier this month you did a uh, an, an episode here of Plan B all about emotional intelligence and this mm-hmm. and that. You were spot on with the value of emotional intelligence. And what we find is that now that, that teams and leaders are working with remote teams and they're having to manage people remotely, it is more important than ever for individuals for professionals to really increase that emotional intelligence because we don't have the, the benefit of being able to be in a room with each other, right? When we're in a room with each other, we can read body language a little bit more, we can have more interactions, we can, can have more touch points to draw some conclusions. Now, you know, when we're here remote, if you can increase your emotional intelligence so that you are more in tune with your own tendencies and the tendencies of others, you're going to build those better relationships you're going to have better, more effective interactions. And these days, I, I'd argue, we all need all the help we can get. Absolutely. You know, w- one of the things with uh, work has always been productivity. You know, whether it was years ago, decades ago, or where we are today, right? It's all about productivity. But then there's also the change that we see in terms of different generations coming into work, whether it was the baby boomers, Generation X, Millennials, Generation Z, and then the future generations to come. 
what's been your experience in terms of the change in work dynamics as a result of new generations stepping in? Well, I, I'll go ahead and take that that one um, because I I'm just I'm older, so I, I've had a chance to see more generations actually come through the pipeline here. Um, I went out to get a job. My first job was flying with Uncle Sam, and, and after that, I got into corporate America. Uh, uh, and when I actually went into consulting, my father-in-law, I think, spent every time that I visited for the first several years asking me when I was actually going to get a job. That that, that entrepreneurship, that that going out, mm-hmm. hanging your own shingle, creating something, was just a foreign concept uh, to. I mean, a wonderful engineer who had had a whole career in a few large organizations. Um, I'm actually really excited about what new generations are actually bringing to the workforce. Um, I have two millennials, uh, very, very proud of them. One of the things that I see happening more and more as, as with each succeeding generation is a little bit more focus on creating good. And, and, and if I really want to look at it, it's what gives me hope about the future. It is I see people asking different sets of questions. Not looking to get a job because of a job, but looking to get a job because of what they can do. And, and, and we're really blessed at, at Integris. A lot of our clients are actually in the nonprofit and government space. And, and part of the reason is it's just a lot of fun to work with people who did not start their work in terms of here's how I'm going to get rich. It's here's how I'm going to serve. Here's how I'm going to create a, a better world. And, and there's just something so exciting about working with people there because everything that you do to try to make them work a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective, to help them communicate a little bit better, you know you're contributing to what's going to help us move forward into a better world. And, uh, and so I, I'm just, I've been excited by each succeeding generation who's pushed us a little bit to make us a little bit better. Each and every time. One of the expert strategies that we cite in solving a people problem, and we, we cite a lot of them, uh, quite honestly. We, we definitely stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, in putting this, this book together. But one of the, one of the authors that we cite is a gentleman named Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink has written, uh, a, a few great books around mm-hmm. psychology, around motivation. One of them is called A Whole New Mind. And in that book, Daniel Pink, uh, essentially boils down human motivation in the workforce to three things, that we're looking for three things. And, and yeah, getting rich is not number one on the list for most people. The, the three things are really boil down to we want autonomy, we want the, the ability to have some mastery, and we want to have purpose. And so whatever we're just talking about there, we're seeing more and more people in the workforce, especially the younger generation, that is asking, you know, what is this organization about? It's not just, okay, what, you know, what do I get? From working for this organization, but what am I contributing to by working for this organization? And when we talk, go, go back to the intro here, you were talking about organizational health. When we can see an organization that is not only taking care of its people, but is delivering services and products that are you know, good for the world and are serving others, you know, that creates the foundation for exactly what we're talking about here, which is a healthy organization. You know, there was an episode that I did uh, way back, and it was called, Is Human Resources the Backbone of a Company or Just a Weak Link? And, you know, there were a lot of comments on that one. And the reason I bring it up is, the point where I was going with it was, human resources at the end of the day still reports into the same leadership. You know, they get their paycheck from the same leadership, yet they're supposed to be this autonomous organization that's actually serving the employee base. And that's the dilemma there. What's your take on that? I, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting dichotomy that actually brings about people maybe to have a little bit of courage. If you're actually going to serve the people in the organization, it means you have to be, at times, the conscience of the organization. Right. When we look for something that's short term, that's a quick fix that, that really doesn't serve the broader purpose, that's when you need to step up. That's when you need to have your voice. It doesn't just go for HR. It goes for any part of the organization. Anybody in leadership has that role of having to, having to raise their hands and say something that may be unpopular at their level that needs to be said. Um, part of how I ended up 
getting to where I got to was several times in my career before I got into consulting, I fired myself. In general, I fired myself when I raised my voice, people weren't willing to listen, and I was unwilling to contribute to something that I did not see as the best way forward for people. Um, good HR is responsible for helping make sure that we actually get the best results for the organization because we can only get those results through people. So if I'm taking care of my people, that's where the, that's where the future can actually come from. You can't improve the organization anywhere near as much as you'd like to without having the people help drive that change. We talk about it when we're doing continuous improvement work with people. You want everybody in the organization actually able to solve problems. If, if people are worried about how the organization is going to use new information, what that's going to, you know, take away my job, those are horrible things to what we can do as an organization. I was always of the mind, and I was lucky enough to have some people work for me who actually followed through on this. If you could, if you could create a way that we didn't need your role, you were way too important for me to let go. I needed to get you into a different role because you were creating more value for the organization, right? right? To think, to think anybody is only the role they currently have is an unfair limitation that we put on people. Everybody has possibility for greatness. If we can invite them to bring that out, and, and that's where organizations really are going to be able to take big jumps forward. When everybody in the organization is pulling in that future direction, and that's when that's when an organization's vision actually starts to become an organization's description. It's not just it's not just the wish. It's when I can actually bring that to life. That's because everybody is making that happen. Well, and when you do that, I mean, what we're talking about here is is really around employee engagement. And one of the benefits that we have today, and I, I, I can't underscore this enough for the entrepreneurs who are, are listening right now and, and those of you who are trying to build your business, that we have the benefit today of a lot of research about employee engagement. The, the first piece that I'll share, uh, is not very encouraging and that's from Gallup. Uh, every year Gallup does a, a big employee mm-hmm. engagement survey, uh, you know, over a hundred thousand people and consistently we see numbers around uh, how many people in the workforce are not engaged at work. And time and time again, survey after survey, it's about a third of people claim to be actually highly engaged in work. That means that two-thirds of us, two-thirds of American workers, and in fact, work, workers around the globe, are saying, you know what, I, I'm not all that engaged at work. The thing that goes along with that data is that in those organizations that have those highly engaged workforces, so many of their business numbers are through the roof compared to their peers that are uh, that have the lower engagement. So things like turnover, way lower in high engagement organizations, errors, uh, defects, product defects, uh, customer service is way higher in those organizations that have high employee engagement. So we, we now know the goodness of employee engagement, not just from a touchy feely kind of a way, like, oh, you know, oh, it's good for people. Because there's still some people that say, you know, well, what about the bottom line? Well, now we have absolute data that shows us, you know what? Engagement is not only good for the human soul, it's actually good for the bottom line. And that data and that research, which really hadn't, hasn't, hadn't been done a whole lot, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, at least not to the degree that it is now. Now that it is so out there and people can see that, that has really opened the door for both small business owners and the HR professionals to have more you know, more energy, more motivation, and more support in saying, you know, we actually need to invest in our people. And by, by investing in our people, what we mean is actually developing their skills, developing their emotional intelligence so that they are more engaged in the workforce. And as Edward was just talking about, they help us build that future safe. So Evans, when we look at, you know, when you look back at your own, your own career background and how far you've mm-hmm. come, you know, what stands out for you in terms of pivotal moments or in terms of things that actually helped you evolve into who you are today? Well, there's a whole lot along the way. Um, but if I were to look at kind of the common elements of it, uh, it has to do with interactions with people. It's, uh, it's learning from leaders 
either great leaders who I saw something I wanted to emulate, I wanted to follow through, and I've had the pleasure of being able to work with someone like that, um, as well as leaders who taught me a little bit different lessons, some things I never wanted to see done to anybody ever again. Um, and then it's the, the big thing for me is the when I see that something I've done has actually had an impact that I may not have even seen. And it's and those are kind of those transformational moments where you realize you don't even know the impact you're having in the world around you. Um, and, and those are the things that make me feel really good about the actions I've taken and, and kind of make me say, you know what, I, I've got to make sure that I create more of those. Um, the goodness that I'm doing is not because I'm going to get a reward. It's, it's I'm doing something for somebody else. I may never hear about it again. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to follow through on. I, and I, uh, 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 I've had the pleasure of having some people track me down years after an interaction to tell me that it had an impact in a, in a way that I didn't even realize at the time. And, and every once in a while, you hear those kind of things, and it, it just it says, okay, I, I'm on the right path. I'm looking for how I can grow in my service to others. And, and for me, that's that's kind of the, that's the big thing here. For for people, entrepreneurs, business leaders, even students, if you're contributing to others, it's amazing what you will find you are able to do and how you are able to grow. It's it, it really is. It's it's not a zero sum game. It, it's it's actually a synergy. And I, if I make others around me successful, I have a really difficult time not becoming more successful myself. Yeah. So, Brett, what's been your journey like? Yeah, well, I, I, I will definitely say, and I'm not surprised that I'm going to say this since Evans and I have been business partners for 20 years uh, here, but the fuel for my journey uh, absolutely has been very similar to what, what Evans is talking about, right? That, that opportunity to serve people, and I've also had the opportunity to have a couple of people come to me after the fact and say, hey, you know, I, I, I saw you speak here, or... You know, I heard what you were saying there and, you know, I took those ideas and I put them to work and you actually helped change my life. And that is fuel to keep going. That is motivation right there. But there's another thing that happened in my life that provided less so the fuel and more so the compass. When I was 17, I was, uh, well, I'll say it this way. I was fortunate to have a near death experience. Now that might not be a, a way that most people would say it, but I say I was fortunate in that it was it was the single most important life, uh, uh, experience of my life as far as shaping how I view the world. So when I was 17, I actually went on a ski trip with my buddies up to Breckenridge, Colorado, which is up at you know, 9,600 feet, over 10,000 when you're on the mountain. And I ended up getting altitude sickness. And uh, my buddies didn't know what was going on, so they didn't get me help right away. By the time they called the paramedics, I had slipped into a coma. And the paramedics took me down the mountain. I was in Denver. I ended up being in ICU for two weeks. For half of that time, I was on full life support. And the neurologist in charge told my parents that if I made it out of this situation, which they weren't sure I was, that I would have, they would expect, they should expect that I was going to be severely brain damaged. Now, I actually have a, a, an older brother. He's five years older than me. And he tells everybody all the time that, see, I told you, he's brain damaged. Right? But, uh, that aside, that experience taught me that life can go at any time. And it was a pretty, pretty pivotal, pivotal moment in my life in that, you know, I'm just getting ready to graduate uh, from high school and go into college and think about where my career is. So there have been several times in my career where that compass, you know, I've, I've looked at it and said, you know, is this the thing that I want to be doing over the course of the next many years? Uh, I'll just give you one example of that, which was a big one for me. Out of undergrad, I started doing financial advising, fell in love with finance, thought, I'm going to take this to the next level. So I went and got an MBA at NYU, and I thought I was going to go the Wall Street route. Well, when I was there at NYU, I worked with a lot of people that were already on Wall Street, got to know the lifestyle a whole lot more, and because of that near-death experience, it, basically I did the math for myself and said, you know, I don't want to... Uh, invest the next you know, really 10 to 15 years of my life you know, doing that work and not much more uh, you know, to get to the end. Uh, now, if I, if I did, I, of course, after 10 years would have been you know, financially set, but I decided that wasn't the right route for me. So I made a different decision. 
uh, and went uh, a different direction and, and took a fantastic role with American Express, which, as we were talking about in the pre-show, which is what uh, drove me to, to work at the World Trade Center um, uh, in New York City, which is a fantastic experience. But I, I would say, Rajiv, that for me, my journey has been a, a series of um, you know, unplanned opportunities. Uh, after American Express, uh, the internet boom was going on, and I met somebody who had a, an internet startup going on, and I said, hey, why don't you come be part of this thing? And so you know, I took the opportunity to do it. Um, and there's a, a, a couple of other those. But I, I would say that the thing for me is you know, always be on the lookout for you know, what are you looking to do with your life as far as you know, how do you want to live your life? What do you want to serve in your life? And then be on the lookout for opportunities and take them as they come. You know, I, I, in my first job interview, I thought that I had to make sure that my life sounded like completely linear, right? That every, everything mm-hmm. that I was right now was exactly planned from, you know, hey, at five years old, I started doing this, then I got a paper right. route, then I started, and, and, and I've learned it's not that at all. It's, it's so ebb flow. But always looking, being able to look out for those opportunities and, and you know, taking that plan B. Really. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. When you have an opportunity to do so. Yeah, very well put. So, under the Integris umbrella, what are the services you offer and where can people find you? So, here at Integris, we do a number of uh, different things, but primarily it's focused on leadership and team dynamics. Uh, our, our mission at the organization is all about uh, influencing and expanding the existence of healthy organizations and great places to work. So if you want to drive higher levels of emotional intelligence in your organization, if you want to develop your leaders, if you want to create better, uh, more effective teams, or if you want to help uh, streamline your processes, that's all within the, the skill set that we bring to the table. Uh, but really, the, the thing, the best place to find us these days is the website for our book, which is solvingthepeopleproblem.com. Uh, Rajiv, if your listeners go there, they can find a whole bunch of information about emotional intelligence and how to develop it. They can even take a free emotional intelligence survey if they'd like to do that. All you have to do is look for the disk EQ or the what's my disk EQ link. And then when they get to the access code page, just have them enter plan B and they'll be able to take the, uh, the emotional intelligence survey for free, which will give them some insights into how well do they know their own style and how well do they know other people's style? So I'd say meet us on uh, online at Solving the People Problem. You can also find both of us at LinkedIn. So I'm at Brett M. Cooper, and Evans is at Evans Taylor. Awesome. And let's talk a little bit about the book. You know, uh, So when did you guys get it published, and what do you think it's uh, you're trying to convey to your audience there? Sure. Uh, the book was published actually on September 29th. Uh, it's done actually very well. We're a bestseller in a number of different categories, including uh, HR and organizational learning. Uh, what we're really trying to get people to understand is uh, emotional intelligence is a powerful force, and it's something that we can we can change. We can grow in our emotional intelligence. And what we do in the in the book is we give them both a model of emotional intelligence and some of the research behind it, but also give them a framework for how they can actually kind of speed up their own development of emotional intelligence by using some uh, uh, personality profile language to be able to talk about emotions and to talk about what are the reactions we have, to understand those patterns, to be able to see that, and then to use that in the work world in terms of how that impacts our communications, our, our ability to handle conflict, uh, our work with teams, our work with people outside of our own circle, our leadership, and even our internal decision-making. How all of those actually are impacted by this and how we can continue to grow that over time. So we share a lot of stories in the book from people who've kind of gone through that process with us, what they've seen, how they've been able to grow, how they've been able to change their own outcomes and their own relationships, including a bunch of relationships that may not have worked all that well when we started working together. But uh, as we as we talk about in the book frequently, our big belief for people is the people problem is not that people are a problem, it's that we fail to understand people. We run people through our own lens. And if we can actually take a step back, be able to understand the differences that we have, appreciate those differences, and even honor those differences, we may find that life is a whole lot more pleasant and we're actually also a whole lot more effective. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Evan and Brett. It's been a pleasure talking to you, talking about your organization, your backgrounds, as well as your book. I'm sure the listeners will check it out. And uh, all the best with the book, and we hope to keep in touch. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Rajiv. Hey, I hope you liked that episode. Please do check out Plan B Success Podcast on your favorite listing platforms. It's also available on www.planb.live. If you're looking to learn how to podcast and learn everything there is to ideate, create, launch, and monetize a podcast, do get in touch through the website www.planb.live. And I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you.